to be here with such a beautiful crowd and such wonderful people that uh, want to learn Taira. Nothing better than uh, engaging yourself in Taira study. I uh, happened to be last week in New York for a wedding. My sister's uh, daughter came from Australia to get married in New York, which is a good thing that they came to New York because I don't think I would have gone to Australia. So uh, the wedding was in New York and uh, I went into 770 and it's so beautiful to see yeshiva boys sitting and studying Torah. Hundreds uh, of them sitting and learning Torah. And I, and I was telling my brother, I wish I was able to join this crowd and go back and sit all day and study Torah. It's, it's the best thing to do. So um, I was thinking about what to discuss today. So, you know, the parasha speaks about the Aseris Adibris, the first time the Ten Commandments are being discussed. So I felt if we discuss the first two of the, of the Ten Commandments, then um, it would probably be the best idea to explain those, those two. So the first two of the Ten Commandments, which you're all very familiar with, is I am God, is the first one. And the second one is don't bow down to idols. Now, you know, I am God, believing in one God, takes a lot of effort. Because, you know, we all believe in ourselves a lot. You know, I'm very intelligent, and I'm very smart, and I'm very wealthy, and I'm very, very kind, and very nice, and I have a lot of potential. So, believing in God, of course, we have to also believe in ourselves. But when you believe too much in yourselves, it could be very dangerous. So, I wanted to discuss today a chapter of Tanya from the Alter Rebbe, from the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, which I'm sure you've heard of. Chapter 26, which speaks about our belief and our, and our belief in Hashem. You know, especially today, it's very important, especially in today's day and age, we try to enhance having trust in Hashem, no matter what's going on in the world, to try to believe in Hashem and have a strong trust and belief in Hashem, no matter what's going on in our personal lives and what's going on in the world. Because we always have many things we could worry about. We're worried about what's going to be with ourselves, what's going to be with our children, our spouse, our family, what's going to be with the economy in the world, what's going to be with the politics what's going to be with Israel. So we have a lot of things on our plate that we, that we constantly worry. So let's try to free ourselves from worry and trust that Hashem and that, that God is going to do the best thing and the outcome is going to be the best. And that comes through our trust in Hashem. So in chapter 26, the Alter Rebbe explains, when you are battling your Yetzer Hara, your evil inclination that tries to get you to have anxiety and depression and worries, when you're not in a good mood, it's hard to win this Yetzer Hara. It's very challenging to win him. The only way you could possibly win him and overpower him is if you're happy and you're in a good mood. So the Alta Rebbe goes through a list of situations that might get us to be unhappy. And he tries as a, as a, per, as the, as a professional psychologist and therapist, which the Alta Rebbe was. He wrote the book of Tanya. He wrote the Shulchan Aruch. And he was able to explain in such a beautiful way how each and every one of us could and should be happy and free of worries. 
So let's discuss what the Alter Rebbe says. This will, as I mentioned before, enhance our trust in Hashem. This will also help us have more belief and stronger belief in one God and not believing in idols and other things that might take away from our full belief in Hashem and worries and the media and all kinds of things that might distract us. So there's two main reasons to why people worry or why you might be sad. The first thing is physical issues, which usually narrows down to three things. In Hebrew, in Aramaic, actually, it's called bana, chaya, umezayim. Bane, we all know, means children. That's our, that's constantly on our mind. If someone, God forbid, doesn't have children, they pray to have children. If they have children, they're worried. What's going to be with them? Are they going to be happy? Are they going to succeed in school? Are they going to find a nice match? Are they going to be successful? We constantly think about our children. And it could make us very worried. And rightfully so. We have a right and a responsibility. No matter how old we are or how old our children are, we constantly worry about them. That's one challenge that we might have. The second thing that's very challenging is called chaye. Chaye means life, which is our health. We're all worried if we're going to be healthy, if we are healthy, we're worried about our health. It's something that's constantly on our mind. The third thing is wealth. We want to make sure we have enough money to live. We want to make sure we have enough funds to pay our rent, to buy food, to help our family. That's three things that could cause us to be sad, maybe even depressed, maybe have anxiety, because we're worried. We're worried about our children. We're worried about our health, and we're worried about our wealth. So the Alter Rebbe tells us something fascinating. It's written in the Talmud. Just like you have to praise God for good things, if you won the lottery, you praise God. If your child passed the bar exam, you praise God. He finished medical school, you praise God. You're, thank God, healthy after a little health challenge. You praise God. Same thing when it comes to wealth. We praise God all the time. Thank God the stock market's up. Thank God things are going well. Just like you praise him for the good, the Talmud says you should praise him for the bad. Now. Now, the Rebbe says, you really can't praise God for the bad. You're not, what are you going to thank him for, for making you sick? Or are you going to thank him for, for making you lose an enormous amount of funds? I mean, it's not, you're not really going to thank him for that. But what it means is, the Alta Rebbe says, accept it with happiness. Even though you lost money. Even though, God forbid, your health is not the way you would like it to be. Even though temporarily something's going on with your children. Accept it with happiness. But wait a minute. <laughs> how, how are you supposed to be happy when you, have, when you don't have any money, just like you're happy when you have money? How do you expect a human being to do that? 
or let's talk about something more serious. How do you expect somebody to be happy when they're sick, just like they're happy when they're healthy? How do you expect somebody to be happy when their children are struggling, just like when their children are happy? How do we expect this from humans? Well, you have to understand, and this is something very important in life in general, you know, there's things you could see with your naked eye. You know, your house that you're sitting in right now, you only see the walls. You only see the ceiling and the floor. You don't see the foundation. You cannot see the foundation that's holding up your house or your building. But you know that there's a foundation holding it up. And you believe that the foundation is strong enough to hold your house or your building up. And that's why you're inside it. But you can't see it. You only could see the walls and the windows that are around you. And that's pretty much the only thing you believe in a revealed way that exists. So when it comes to, to God, to Hashem, you only see, you only appreciate when something good is happening. When you have plenty of money in your bank account. This is great. I'm so happy. Now, what's if I don't have any money on February 1st to pay my rent or my mortgage? How do you expect me to be happy? And, and it's coming up in about two weeks or less than two weeks. So how do you expect someone that doesn't have the funding for February 1st, how do you expect him to be happy? Comes along the Alter Rebbe and tells us as follows. But before, let me tell you a story of the Talmud that the Alter Rebbe refers to as well. You know, there was a story with the Nachum Gamzu. You probably heard of the story many times. He was traveling to the king to ask him to help the Jews. And... On the way, he brought, he brought with him a box of diamonds, beautiful diamonds to bring to the king. On the way, he stopped at a hotel and he was resting at the hotel and the hotel owner realized that this rabbi is carrying a box and he said, uh, he's going to check out what's going on in the box. So he goes to the box, he opens it up, he sees diamonds. So he takes the diamonds and he switches it for rocks or dirt, fills it up with something else. Now, when the rabbi wakes up and he sees the box, he checks to see what's inside it, and he sees that it's a bunch of rocks. Anyways, he takes the box and he says, you know what, if this is what it is, it is what it is. Everything Hashem does is for a good reason. So he brings the box to the king. He travels to the king. The king opens it up and he says, wait a minute, this is what you give me as a gift. You deserve death. But the king said, wait a minute, it's impossible that this rabbi would bring me just rocks or dirt as a gift. Definitely he would bring me something more meaningful. So he takes the rocks and he utilizes them. And next time he went to a battle, all these rocks turned into, into bow and arrows. And when he threw them, miraculously it turned into weapons to fight his enemies. What do we see here? The rabbi could have been very depressed. Look at this. Look what happened. Life is terrible. It's all a bunch of rocks. How am I going to go to the king? But he didn't think that for one moment. He had positive thinking. He was happy. He said, if God did this, it must be for the best. And it ended up turning out positive. In our lives, we have a similar idea. 
when God created the world, he created things that are revealed to us. So you see with your naked eye that when you have health and wealth, it's good. Now, if God forbid you don't have the money you need, it's also good. To you, it might look bad. But to Hashem, it's good. Because everything he does is good. Now, wait a minute. How could it be good? If I don't have money to pay my bills, how do you call that good? Well, it's good because it's coming from such a high place of God, so high, that by the time it comes down, because it's so high, by the, by the time it comes down to us, it translates into bad. Let me give you an example to understand what this means. The sun, especially in Florida, maybe not today, but the sun in Florida, the sun generally, is very, very powerful, extremely strong. Now, if you want to accept the sun, you need to put, up, put on sunglasses. You need to maybe close your shade or else it might be too sunny. So the only way for me to accept the direct sun is by creating a cover. When I put on sunglasses, I don't have the direct sun. I have the sun watered down and now it's a lower level of the sun. I'm not receiving the sun itself. I'm receiving the sun with a cover. Now, when I take off my sunglasses, I will receive the strong sun. It might not be good for me, but the bottom line is I'm getting a stronger light from the sun when I'm not wearing glasses. So I have sort of a stronger connection to the sun. I can't receive it. It's too strong for my eyes, too strong for my body. But at the same time, I'm ultimately receiving a stronger, more powerful sun. And this is what we're referring to. When you have all the funds you need, when you have all the health you need, when you have joy from your children, this is all excellent and we pray for that. But it's still the lower level. When things are not going so good, God is giving you a higher level. It's called the hidden world of God, which is coming down to you. It's a level that to you looks bad, but really it's good. You know, think of a very simple example. When your child fails on a test and you get really upset at them because they don't study, they're not even putting in the effort, and you yell at them, you punish them for not working hard enough. Now, is that punishment love? Or that punishment is coming from, God forbid, from hating your child? Of course it's coming from love. You care so much about your child, that's why you're getting upset. If your friend's son failed on their test, you probably don't even care. <laughs> what do I care if my friend's son got a 30 on their test? doesn't bother me. It bothers me when it's my son and I care about him because I love him. So I'm giving him tough love. I'm rebuking him. I'm trying to educate him because I love him, because I'm close to him. So temporarily, when you're receiving something negative in your life, which of course you should pray that it should stop immediately, but when you're praying for it, 
at the same time when it's happening in your life, when there's something negative going on in your life, always realize that it's coming from love. It's, 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 coming, it's coming from love. Because he loves you, he's giving you such a high level. He's giving you the strong sun, so to speak. You might not be able to handle it, but everything God does is good. There's nothing bad. I want to tell you a story to emphasize this. Story that will help you understand what we're trying to bring out here. I mean, it's a it's very simple concept because, you know, there's things you could see. Think about when you go on an airplane. You, do, you don't even see the pilot when you get on most of the time. You don't see how the engines work. You don't even know if they're properly working. All you see is the inside of the plane with your seat, and that's it. But you know and you trust that there's something much greater going on here that's causing this plane to take off in the air and, God willing, land safely. So there's what you see with your eye, and then there's what's going on around it. So this is a simple example because you could figure out the engines. You could figure out how, what the pilot studies. These are things that you could dwell into and try to understand. If you think about the way Hashem runs the world, everything he does is good. Of course, we all have questions. Why would he make innocent people die? And why the Holocaust? And why the Spanish Inquisition? And why? Of course, we have questions. But we do all have a belief that what's happening is good. Maybe we don't see it. And we pray that the circumstances should change because we can't handle it. There's a story that happened in the times of the Rebbe Marash. The Rebbe Marash was the fourth Lubavitcher Rebbe. So you're talking about over a hundred years ago. The Rebbe Marash had a student, a chassid, a follower, one of his, one of his, one of, one of his many followers. And he was a very wealthy man. In Russia, we all know it used, it used to be, they were very wealthy. And then there was a lot of poverty. A lot of people were very poor. This man, his name was Rab Moshe. Moshe would not do anything. No business deals. No big decisions until he asked the Rebbe Marash for his advice. Many investors came over to Rab Moshe and they said, Rab Moshe, you know, we have this business deal that we've been working on for months. You have to invest a huge sum of money. But the return, the return is unbelievable. It's not a 6% return. It's not a 20% return. Your money is going to double or maybe triple or maybe even more. We're going to be buying fields and then we're going to sell them. It's a whole big business deal that they were working on for a really long time. And they told Rab Moshe, we want you to invest in this deal. Okay. Rab Moshe traveled to the Rebbe Marash. When Rab Moshe arrives to the Rebbe Marash, he tells the Rebbe Marash, he tells his Rebbe, you know, I have this deal that I've been working on with many investors for a long time. And it's going to cost me a lot of money. I'm risking most of my wealth. 
I'm only going to be left with a small amount of wealth. Should I do it or shouldn't I do it? And he told the Rebbe Marash all the details. <laughs> the Rebbe told him, no, in my opinion, you're not going to be successful. I hold you should turn it down. Okay. <laughs> he listened to the Rebbe Marash. He listened to what he said. But he wasn't very happy with what the Rebbe told him. So he was in a dilemma. He didn't know what to do. On one hand, On one hand, he couldn't do something without the Rebbe Maharaj's uh, consent. But on the other hand, he was pretty disappointed. The deal sounds amazing. You know, it's like you want to buy a stock and your broker says this is a fantastic deal. And you turn it down. So on his way home, he was very disappointed, but... He has to listen to the Rebbe. Okay. A few days later, the investors come over to him and they say, Rab Moshe, Rab Moshe, Nu, you're ready for the deal? He says, no, I can't do it. They say, what do you mean? <laughs> this is a deal of your lifetime. We have so many people invested money. You, you can't turn this down. So he decided, oh, so he tells them, the Rebbe said, I can't do it. So he decided he's going to go back to the Rebbe. He goes back to the Rebbe and he tells the Rebbe, you know, maybe you don't understand the details and so on and so forth. And the Rebbe listens to him. And the Rebbe tells him, it's not a good idea. You should turn it down. He goes back to them again a third time, a second time. And they come over to him and they say, no, you're doing the deal. He says, no, the Rebbe doesn't let me do it. They tell him, what the Rebbe? The Rebbe doesn't know. He's not a businessman. He's a rabbi. He's a Rebbe. He's a holy man. He prays. He studies Torah. He's not into business. Go back to him and make sure you told him everything. They go back to the Rebbe for the third time. He goes back to the Rebbe for the third time. And the Rebbe doesn't tell him much. He just says the word no. Rabbi Moshe goes back to his hometown. When he comes back, he cannot hold himself in. The pressure from his friends was so big. The pressure was so strong and it sounded so great. Like I told you before, in the, to the naked eye, it looked fantastic. On paper, it looked fantastic. What he heard sounded fantastic. So he did it. He took almost 90% of his wealth and invested it in these fields and lands and so on and so forth. The Rebbe was right. A few months passed and he lost all his money. Literally, something went wrong. He lost his entire investment. Now he was left a poor man, completely poor. Now, now he really had to go back to the Rebbe, embarrassed. And he told the Rebbe, I'm sorry, please bless me now. I'm completely poor. He spent 
an unusual long time in the Rebbe's private study, which is unusual. Usually when you go into the Rebbe, it was a minute or two, maybe five minutes, but he was spent an unusual long time in the Rebbe. And the Rebbe told him, I have three different types of followers. The first type says, if the Rebbe says something, it's like God talking to me and I must listen. That's it. There's no other way about it. The Rebbe says something, I listen. I don't argue with him. Why? Because it's like God giving me a message. <laughs> it's like Moses talking to me. If Moses tells you to do something, you're going to argue. If Moses tells you to take a flight to Israel now, you're going to argue. If Moses tells you to sell your house and buy another one, you're not going to argue. You're going to listen because it's Moses. It's like God talking to you. That's the first group of followers that I have. The second group are people, maybe they don't say God is talking from his mouth, but he's a holy man. He studies a lot of Torah, and he knows what he's talking about, so I'm going to listen to him. That's already a lower level. The third level, which is completely very low, the, the, the third group says, you know what? The Rebbe doesn't know, uh, you know, the Rebbe's not necessarily so holy, but he has experience. You know, every day he's meeting people, and many people are talking to him about business. So when so many people are talking to him about business, he has experience what to answer. So I better listen to him because his experience is better than anyone else. The Rebbe told Rabbi Moshe, you're off this chart completely. You're not one because you didn't listen. You're not the two for sure, not in the third for sure, not because you didn't listen to what I told you. So in other words, the point of the story is basically It looked beautiful, but it wasn't. It was terrible. He lost his entire income, his entire wealth. To him, it looked so good. To the Rebbe, which sees further than we do, to the Rebbe that sees things it didn't look good at all. The other way around is true as well. To you, it might look bad. And in the story, the same thing. To him, it looked bad if he doesn't do it. And it looked terrible. But the end would have been very good. And this is where it comes to our day-to-day -day life. It might look terrible. What's going to be with the economy in the world? What's going to be with politics? What's going to be with myself? What's going to be with my children? What's going to be with my business? And the list goes on and on and on. But when you believe that everything is for the good. When you believe that there is a higher power that's controlling everything that's going on and God is the ultimate good. And when someone is good, when someone is kind, they do kind things. Then you are completely never worrying, and never sad, and always happy. The Alter Rebbe explains as well, God's name has four letters. The main name of God has four letters. Yud, and a He, and a Vav, and a He. So the first two is a Yud and a He. Yud and He, are the highest letters of God's name. The Vav and the He are the lower letters of God's name. 
When something negative is happening, you're actually receiving it from the higher level of God's name. You're right now receiving strong love. When it's revealed good, it's a lower level. Now, we're not capable of receiving the higher level until the coming of Mashiach. As of now, we're not ready for that. As of now, we're, we're still very limited and very narrow understanding of Hashem. So we're not ready yet for that higher level. But one thing is for sure. If you accept it with love, Hashem will remove it and make life good for you. Now, it's very important that if God forbid something negative is happening to someone else, you're never supposed to tell them, it's okay, don't worry. Hashem is giving you love. You have to try to pray for them and help them that the circumstances should change. And you can't tell them, well, God is punishing you. We're not the ones to say that. There's a, there's a similar idea when we put on tefillin, for those that put on tefillin, when you're saying the prayer before the Shabbat, you say, Yotzer Ar, which means Hashem that created light, Uvore Choshech, and who created dark. So when you Say that prayer, you're supposed to touch your tefillin. So when you say create light, you touch the tefillin on your hand. And when you say create dark, you touch the tefillin on your head. But wait a minute. Isn't light greater than darkness? Why would I touch the tefillin on the hand, which is lower level, when I say light, and touch the tefillin on the head when I say dark? We all know that the tefillin on the head is much greater than the tefillin on the hand. That's why it has the four sections. That's why it's on your head, which is more revealed to everybody around you. So why would you touch the hand when you say light and touch the head when you say dark? It should be touch the hand when you say dark and touch the head when you say light. So according to what we just explained, we can understand the concept. Dark is higher than light. Because it's so high that by the time it comes down to me, it looks dark. I can't handle it. But really, it has such a high, it has such a high source. So that's why I touch the tefillin on the head when I say dark. Similar idea. When you're explaining someone on a lower level something, let's say you have knowledge in something that someone else doesn't have. Or let's pick a simple example. You're teaching a two-year-old how to read. So you show them the letters and you show them an aleph, you show them a bet, or you're showing them an A or a B, and you're teaching them letters. You're teaching them how to read. So. You're, you already know this, but you're lowering your intellect to the child to be able to give him the ability to understand it. Now, if you're going to talk to the child on the same level you understand it, it's going to be dark for the child. But that dark for the child is ultimately light for you, but dark for him. So in other words, the higher it is for you, the darker it is for the child. So dark that we can't handle is ultimately because it comes from a very high level. 
higher than what we can handle. In other words, in other words, like this. Hashem loves every single one of us. Every one of us. He created us. And we have a purpose why we're here. And he wants us to be happy. He wants us to have health, wealth, peace, Sometimes things don't go the way we expect it. You know, we have a vision of what we think life's going to look like. And when it's not heading that direction, we get very frustrated because we're not in control. And when we're not in control, we get very upset because we love being in control, especially those that are controllers. We like to be in control. But if things not going the way you want, you lost control. Hashem is in charge. He's controlling now. He's always controlling. But now you see it even more because there's nothing you could do. So when you put yourself a step higher than what your eye could see, you put yourself in a more spiritual state of mind. You put yourself, so to speak, in Hashem's thinking, which we don't understand. We will never understand. But when we put ourselves in a level higher, when we put ourselves above what the norm is, we will start realizing that we're going to be happy no matter what's going on. We all know the famous phrase, which you've probably been taught many times, Trachot Vetzangot. One of the third Lubavitcher Rebbe's followers, his son was terribly sick. And he came to the Tzemach Tzedek, to the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, and he was explaining to him how the situation is really terrible, and he was crying, and he was very upset. And the Tzemach Tzedek told him, everything will be fine, but if you think positive, it will be positive. You know, there's a, there's a story with the Lubavitcher Rebbe as well. <clears throat> Somebody came to the Rebbe from England, and he asked the Rebbe to be his partner in business. So the Rebbe agreed. The Rebbe gave him obviously a very small sum of money, maybe $20, <laughs> to be a partner with the Rebbe. And he went back to England and he was uh, investing in fur. He would buy all different types of fur. And that's what he was doing. And he, the Rebbe told him to buy a lot of fur. So he bought. Then he told the Rebbe how much he bought. So the Rebbe told him buy more. Fine. So he bought more. Then the Rebbe told him to take more money out of his house. You know, uh, take a uh, refinance at your house, take a mortgage, take loans. And the Rebbe gave him a certain amount, how much he wanted him to buy. And he bought. And the Rebbe told him to continue buy, and he continued buying. Spent pretty much all his, all his wealth, similar to our previous story, and he bought a huge amount of fur. And then the Rebbe told him, okay, you could stop buying. So he stopped. <laughs> the buying was over. Now it's time to make money. Lo and behold, the price of fur went down. 
So the man started getting very worried. He wasn't a Chabad Chassid. He was just uh, friends with Chabad. And he continued getting worried. What am I going to do? And the price went down. He wrote to the Rebbe. He said to the Rebbe, should I sell? You know, at least I'll make uh, some money back. The Rebbe told him, no, do not sell. The price continued going down. And the man started getting very worried. What am I going to do? And he started, he started even getting upset at his Chabad rabbi. <laughs> Look, the Rebbe calls me to lose huge sums of money. But he can't sell because the Rebbe is his partner. And the partner has to tell him what to do in order to do it. And the price of fur continued going down. If he would sell it at this point, he would maybe get back 30% of his money. And the Rebbe told him, do not sell. All of a sudden, after either it was several months or several years, the price of fur started going back up. It didn't just go back up, it went up much higher than the price that he bought the fur for. Went up so much and he asked the Rebbe, should he sell? The Rebbe still said no. Finally, it went up to a really high price and the Rebbe agreed to sell. And he became extremely wealthy. He asked the Rebbe if he should what he should do with the Rebbe's half of the money. And the Rebbe told him to give it to a specific organization, a cheder or a school, whatever it was. Then he went back to New York and he asked the Rebbe to be his partner again. The Rebbe told him, you're a very hard, you're a tough partner. I'm not gonna do it again. And the man was obviously disappointed, but the point here was, he didn't have, he was lacking that full belief in Hashem, in the Rebbe, that what looks bad, it looked terrible. The thing was going down and he almost lost everything. What looked so bad really had a positive outcome. It looked like he was losing all his money, but there was light at the end of the tunnel. It looked bad and it felt bad, but it wasn't bad. It was good. The waiting was good. The potential of what's going to come out of this was actually good. In his eyes, it looked bad. And this is what we have to take as well. There is the hidden world of God, which is called Alma de Scassia. There is the revealed world of God, which is called Alma de Scalia, which is our world. Our world, health is good. Wealth is good. Joy from your children is good. But what's about the hidden good? If God forbid somebody lost their wealth, maybe God forbid something worse would have happened. Maybe something worse was supposed to happen and God saved you from that. That's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it, that that in its own is good. And there's something good going to come out of this. Whether here, whether in the future, maybe in the world to come and so on and so forth. And that's allowing us to constantly be happy. If do es Hashem besimcha, you should serve Hashem with happiness. Serve Hashem with happiness is a challenge. With all the technology and all the social media, we always know exactly within the seconds what's going on in the world. A lot of things could cause us anxiety and be depressed and worried. But when we tap into this belief in one God and He controls the world, then we're always going to be happy. Whether we understand it, whether we don't understand it, it will ultimately translate to something happy. And studying Torah is real happiness. 
So the more you enhance yourself in Torah study, the more you will be happy. So when you feel down and you feel lonely and you don't feel like no one cares about you, study Torah. And then you will be true happiness. And may Hashem help that very soon we should merit the coming of the Mashiach when we'll all have time and, and effort and energy and proper focus to be able to study Torah the entire day, not only for short hours during the day. Thank you very much, Rabbi Smith and everybody for... Oh, man. Oh, man. Thank, thank you so thank, much, thank uh, you Rabbi, so much Man. Rabbi Man. Um, if anyone has any anyone questions has... or any thoughts, any uh, insights... Very inspirational. Very inspirational, Rabbi Man. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I know I, I find it difficult sometimes to just go with the idea of as I'm drowning that this is good for me. But I do know that, and I think you can explain even more the business about Chayshech and R. It's Yitzer R Uvayre Chayshech. Hashem had to create darkness, but Yotzer R is he just formed light from someplace. So Chayshech is definitely the more, the bigger Bria over here. But besides that, if I'm going through a tough time, and I found, I reflect back how I managed to survive. And I realized that when things were really getting tough, I just remembered a different pasuk altogether. By he Erev, by he Vaika. There's no Vaika without an Erev beforehand. So whatever it is I was struggling through, I looked at it as, okay, this is tough, but there's, you want to say light at the end of the tunnel? Maybe that's where it came from? I don't know. But I think it's a different approach. Rather than trying to convince me now it's like trying to calm somebody down when they're angry. You don't do it. But when you get calmed down, you can talk in a different way. But at the time that I'm getting hit with it, I managed to stay happy because I go, all right, this is the worst of it. And then usually it gets worse. But no, so what? It's but eventually there's a biker, so it's fine. Very good. I like that. Excellent. And actually, the Yitzhar Art of Arde Chayshech, the, you all, the, there's four different worlds. There's Atzilos, Bria, Yitzira, and Asiya. So when it says Uvayre Chayshech, it refers to the world of Bria. And then Yitzhar Art is Yitzira, which actually Bria is higher than Yitzira. So it's the same idea that it's uh, coming from a higher world, the Chayshech. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yashikoyach. Okay, well, um, any other uh, last thoughts? Yes, David. Yeah, the idea that we touch our head to fill and when we say choshech, it was explained to me that we're embarrassed that the mind could go to the gutter. So it's a kind of embarrassment, which is similar, I think, to the Friedrich Rebbe explained the idea of a yarmulke. A person wears a yarmulke because he's embarrassed that his brain could take him down to such a low level. So that's the idea of a chosha. Good. Chosha and the head. Chosha and the head to film. Very nice. Wow. Shkoyach, David. Okay, well, thank you so, so much, Rabbi Man. And uh, everyone, we'll see you tomorrow, Miyot Hashem. Sai gesund. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi Man. Okay. Bye. Bye. Take care. Rabbi Man. Take care. All right.